Okay. So hello and a very good morning to all of you. So before I start the session, uh, let's have a very uh, quick recap of uh, recap of what, uh, what what all things you have done so far. Okay. So uh, so let me know in the chat window, or you can speak also, right? So how comfortable uh, are you with uh, JavaScript so far? So at least the basic things are clear to everyone. Much, much better when you started, right? And I think you also got enough time uh, to go through the materials during the last two, three days. Okay, the reason I asked you to go through the videos uh, was because, um, right, so we have limited time for JavaScript actually, and most of our time will be spent with uh, Elixir and Phoenix and related stuff. So I just wanted to ensure that you have a fair idea about JavaScript because at some point in time in your development career, you have to face that. And that's kind of the whole agenda. Okay, and uh, uh, before I kind of continue, let me uh, take a moment uh, to open up that uh, uh, JavaScript uh, speech that I shared with you on YouTube just to ensure that we are talking the same language. OK. Um, is the screen YouTube video uh, kind of clear to everyone? OK, there was two sets of videos that I had shared with you all, right? So one is essential JavaScript for, uh, for frameworks and library, I suppose. Right? And this, is, I think most of you might have completed by now. Uh, is that assumption correct, everyone? Let me know. Okay, and, think, and, and, and I, I think you learned a couple of new things in there as well, right? As you did this, some new things which you might have not known earlier and things like that. Okay, now it's very, very important that um, this uh, uh, two or three videos, right? You have to uh, maybe repeat multiple times as needed, okay? Okay, one or two times, sometimes uh, if you are new to this thing, right? Uh, it may not get in, get easily clicked, and you may not get an exact idea. You may get a fair understanding, but the idea is uh, you have to keep on uh, revisiting these things as needed, and you can then watch other videos also. It's not needed that only the video that I share, right? You have to go through it. The thing is, just pick up the topic that I shared and maybe watch other better videos out there. Okay, so I tried to consolidate the video, uh, things into organ into kind of an organized form so that you can refer materials in a sequence rather than ad hoc searching for things and uh, working with items. Okay, so this is very, very important part. So this will clear up a lot of conceptual things. The second part was uh, this 14 weeks of JavaScript. It's kind of a continuously updated thing. Let me just uh, pause it for a moment. Yeah. Okay, so, so far, uh, this section has about eight to nine videos, I suppose. Yeah, eight or nine videos. Okay, so any of you uh, went through this? And if yes, how many uh, of these videos are done? Okay, some of it will be revision to you as well. Oh, eight videos. That's really great, actually, if you're able to reach to the eight videos. How did you find these videos? Was it useful, this series for 10 weeks? This is still in progress, huh? And you will actually continuously get it updated. Uh, uh, as, as you progress along for the next three to six months. A lot of use cases will be added in here. Maybe I'll invite you to my public group, also Telegram group, where we do this weekend batches. So in case some of you are interested, you can join that as well. Okay, that's totally community driven. Okay, so that can be done. Very great, yeah. Okay, so once you are, uh, uh, take some time whenever you are free, whenever, it doesn't matter what time you are doing it, early morning, 5 baje, 6 baje, raat ke bara baje, doesn't matter. Whatever time you are comfortable with, uh, comfortable with, uh, try to uh, finish this off and take a shot at this uh, e-commerce e front-end part. Okay, whenever you are free. Okay, eight weeks tak ho gaya na, this, uh, the last part will be quite easy to follow as well. Okay. So this will actually give you a very, very good foundational knowledge when you work with other front-end um, uh, libraries like React or maybe Angular in future, depends. So for IDFI, so far it's React uh, kind of. So some of you may be working on React probably. So you will find the JavaScript sessions very, very useful. 
and react will be very very easy to understand as well okay that's kind of the goal okay so i'll just close this out these two things so before i continue uh, any common questions you have or any any doubts that is still lingering in your mind it's a good time to ask uh, i have one uh, doubt regarding the basics of url so mm -hmm. basically when we suppose we have a domain xyz.com okay and mm -hmm. we like uh, do www.xyz.com so by default the index.html page is loaded right yeah it's a correct assumption so far but i'll correct it yeah you can yeah okay. you can tell me so suppose uh, like we had the third video in the first playlist so in mm -hmm. that if we have like www.xyz.com slash mm -hmm. hash slash new something like that so mm -hmm. how will uh, like how does it know that slash hash slash new is not some file that it has to fetch instead it is the uh, some route inside index.html like how is the distinction made okay yeah. so we haven't get uh, reached that part of the topic yet but let me cover that part uh, since the question has come right so what typically happens in a web application is um, let me just bring up this window okay so typically see you have a server here right so maybe the server is in here and this is your server correct and somewhere down the line you have a lot of clients maybe the clients can be a mobile device right depends it can be a desktop okay and all these clients are kind of connecting to to some servers okay so this is a very simple representation now take it to get some pages now assume this is your internet okay in a very very simple simplified manner Though there are thousands of servers, right? We are just simply taking one example kind of thing. So this is doing say www.google.com. Okay, and this may be doing something like um, maybe Netflix.com/slash/movies/slash/some movies. Okay, and here you may have something like Gmail.com. Hash, hash, maybe inbox, and maybe something like ID equal to something. And these are the typical kind of requests that you make to a web server, right? But there are a lot of other servers that typically comes into play. Okay, before your request is finally served, so there is something called as a DNS server in between, right? This is a domain name server. Okay, and there are a lot of other other things. Okay, so we'll talk about maybe the, those other things at a later point in time. Now, to answer your question, what typically happens is, suppose you uh, make a request to www.google.com. This URL, URL resolution will happen, and the IP address of the server will be found, and a request will be sent to that server, right? And what the server will do is, it will check whether what is the request URL in here. Okay, and by default, what happens is the server is typically configured. Okay, configured to serve index.html. Okay. This is just a convention, but it can be other file as well. Okay, in certain cases, it is default, default.html, or .aspx, or some other extension. It can be anything in there. Is the first part clear to everyone so far? Let me know. Okay, so that that can be anything. Whatever the server is configured to serve by default, right? That that file is being sent, and majority of the time it will be index.html. Now see, whenever a client and server request happens, okay, a client makes a request with some additional information, and the server responds accordingly. Okay, so this is the typical client-server model, right? And this is slight differences when we talk about uh, single page applications, wherein uh, JavaScript plays a very, very prominent part. Certain parts get executed on the server, and certain part get executed on the client, depending on how the routes are configured. Okay. Now assume the routes are configured on the server side. So let's take a simple example. So I have a server here. Okay, we have a server. This is our server, and let's say we have one client here.
okay this client is kind of say making a request to the server and it will tell get me gmail.com okay so this uh, this this request goes to the server and uh, it does all those validations etc etc assuming things uh, the user is authenticated okay and it serves serves back an html http response right an http response is sent back okay and here a request goes actually this is called http request okay, because it uses hypertext transfer protocol okay very sim simple way to communicate over the web kind of thing okay and an html page is rendered assume an html page is rendered here right that shows your users and your emails in here okay and maybe this same user may click on some button here right maybe he's checking the mail right there is an inbox here there may be sent there may be draft okay now assume for a moment assume for a moment that this gmail is not a single page application okay now what i mean by it is not a single page application all the requests will directly go to the server okay is, is that statement clear to everyone so far so far uh, when i say something is not a single page application all the requests will go to the server this is clear everyone let me know. Okay, so what do I mean by that? One more time. Suppose the user clicks on draft. Okay, draft. So internally, when he clicks on the draft here, the URL is there, right? It's https dot maybe like gmail dot com and maybe draft, something like this is there. Just a second now. I think it hanged for a moment. Okay, the machine has just freeze for a moment. Just allow it a moment. Uh, is my voice coming in there because my machine is hanged? I'm just cross checking. Okay. I think after some Windows updates has happened, right? The machine it kind of become a bit sludgy. I may need to check this later on. Okay, I think it is back. Okay, so draft right something like this a request may go okay and there could be some other information here some id or anything right? this doesn't matter actually what is the url now see this is when the user clicks on this draft okay a request is sent to the gmail server with this url right so this request will be sent to the browser sorry to the server here okay and since this is a full url the url address bar of the url changes Okay, and it knows this is a server side request because you are actually making a get request from here. Okay, this will go to the server side. Okay, and this Gmail server here, it will identify this resource which is draft. Okay, this is what the information that the user needs, and it will serve back a page. Okay, accordingly, it will serve back a page to this client. Okay, and that draft will be rendered here. Okay, this is purely server side, right? If you click on send here, all the sent messages, right? 
so a url with the sent something like this will be sent okay and the url will check the thing is every time you make a request that entire request goes to the server and this entire page will be rendered again no matter what everything will be rendered that is a server side rendering okay so assume there is no client side router or anything like that so this is what is typically happening so whatever link you click it will go to the server okay because there is no javascript written on the page so it will go to the server okay and you will get the response back now what typically happens in a single page application is this so you have a server here again okay this is your server and so you have a client let's take one client again okay and this client request say assume this is a gmail server for simplicity sake so this will request http gmail.com okay and this gmail is a single page application okay and assuming this user is logged in okay response will be sent back from the server okay and that page will be rendered here right so that page may look something like this right so this is say the gmail page okay and uh, there will be the logo maybe somewhere here there will be a menu and there will be a detail section here right and there will be inbox sent draft and maybe compose to compose a new message right something like this will be there okay now the thing here is now on first request this entire content entire content is sent back from the server this entire page uh, is sent back from the server and this is rendered on the browser and browser means this is rendered on the client side right that that part we already know so this means everything is there here okay and also the javascript is loaded whatever library or framework gmail may be using it could be simple javascript vanilla javascript it could be jquery it could be react it could be anything right so that javascript library or frame is loaded js library is loaded okay and it takes control of this page okay and whatever that js library is it takes control of this page okay now when someone says javascript takes control of this page that means things are now happening on the client side which is here okay that means if i click on the send button a request is not directly sent to the server this send button click is intercepted by javascript code okay and something will happen js code will intercept it okay and some action will be performed is this clear so far everyone let me know the difference in a single page application the javascript is there so javascript will intercept the click okay intercept the click and maybe what it will do not to simulate a single page it will also change the url also intercept the click maybe change url and things like that but this is done through javascript okay and what the javascript will then do it will make a fetch api call probably right? you all know fetch api right or maybe some other library like axios it will use to make a server side call to fetch the sent message correct and this call will go to this gmail server okay and it will only send that this sent information back it will not give back this entire page only the sent information is sent back and again javascript will uh, kind of click in and start rendering this page okay everything is happening on the client side okay now why client side because javascript is controlling that okay so typically browser supports two two kind of navigations or router you can call okay one is the older one called hash based routing Okay, and the modern one, which is known as uh, HTML5 push state. Push state. Okay, these are the routing mode supported on the client side, which is browser side. Okay, now hash based routing, you will immediately recognize because in the URL, you will see this hash. Anyone observed hashes on the URL? Let me know. 
you might have when you you might have opened gmail or something like that right let me just show you very quickly i am able to i am not sure so the old gmail had that i am not sure whether the ah, the new gmail also has, has it see if you can see this right in here see the url mail right you hash inbox is this clear everyone observation okay this hash in uh, inbox indicates that gmail is using a hash based routing so if i click on the say important messages right or maybe the sent message you will see this url is getting changed here hash sent right so this everything is kind of happening on the client side because that hash based routing understand the client side part right because that's how javascript is coded okay and that it will determine okay the message is sent it will make a sent request to the server but only this much data is sent not this entire page is not rendered the ui the logo is not changing right nothing is changing only the content is changing it's not the crypt cryptography hash it's simple hash based routing we call it as nothing related to the crypt uh, cryptography hash okay so hash based uh, routing simply means you have a hash here right so this is how the browser and the server knows that this request is coming is actually a clown's client side routing right so anything after this hash send is actually processed by the client and not by the server server doesn't know anything the meaning of this probably unless it is explicitly coded okay even if i do a refresh no when i do a refresh the entire request will go to the server huh? because you did a browser refresh right but then once this basic things are fetched the rest of the things are handled by the client side which is javascript okay basically because it understand there is a hash based routing here and the sent information will be see correctly loaded even though i did a refresh here right because when you refresh always a request will go to server that is very very important that's why you see this loading right entire thing is loading because you refresh but then once the basic page is rendered okay then a client side request for this hash is sent hash sent is done and the sent information is available here okay similarly if you go to inbox okay you will have this loading in loading is still okay this is client side loading but this entire page is not loaded okay and you get that information here this is hash based routing okay, and what is push state routing probably uh maybe just to show you let me check whether i have an information of push state routing just a second now Let me just show you a single page application. Okay, I don't have it, I suppose. yes manish the server ignores the thing after the hash unless we have coded something to explicitly do on the server side okay otherwise it will simply take the base route that is configured and it will send back the response okay but you can change the behavior of the server also okay let me just um, kind of open a couple of things in here uh netflix i'm not sure it has its um, i think i may have to restart my machine machine once actually uh to fix this because it's kind of getting freezed
Okay, so hash based routing is very clear. The moment you observe this hash here in the URL, that typically guarantees that, okay, this is a client side routing implemented in here, and this is kind of a single page application. Okay, one, one, one more example is probably Twitter, uh, but let me check whether uh, it's kind of um, using a hash based routing or a HTML5 push state routing. Okay, the difference will be uh, the hash based routing you will immediately identify here, but push state routing you won't because it's a clean URL, right? So it will become kind of difficult to understand. Whether it's a uh, yeah, so if you take a look at the Twitter message, Twitter here, just a second, I think. Okay, so if you take a look at this Twitter here, take the take a look at the URL here, right? There is no hashes, correct? Everyone, this is clear. Okay, if you click on Explore, see the page. Only this part is loading, right? The entire page is not loading. Okay, but the URL, if you take a look at the URL, it is slash explore. Okay, this is clear the difference in the hash based routing and uh, the push state routing. Push state routing is clean, clean URL, the modern modern way to build your routing. Okay, hash based routing because it works everywhere. So Google hasn't still upgraded uh, that part. So th they still use the hash based routing here. This part is clear, everyone let me know. Okay. Now, difference is how how do uh, this serve, uh, the browser or server knows whether this is a client side routing or server side routing, right? That could be a question for everyone. Okay. Remember this one: if I do a refresh, always the request will go to server. Okay, but once it comes back, okay, with whatever base page is available, depending on what kind of routing is implemented, the JavaScript will kick in and will load up the respective rest, rest of the part after slash. Okay, if single page application is implemented. Otherwise, it is a simple server side routing. It will go to the server, bring this entire page with this home, logo, everything will be loaded. But in client side routing, you will observe only the center part is changing, right? That's why the parts are not changing because only the base page is coming and that's why the things are dynamically loaded. Okay? So is this routing part clear to everyone? How that is implemented? Maybe we'll talk about later on. But I think the difference is clear, right? So whenever you do, you do a refresh, always the request will go to the server, right? And the base page is loaded, and then JavaScript will kicking, and it will look at the route values and load the exact, load the appropriate page. Okay, if routing is not implemented on the client side, the entire page will be served by the server. Okay, that's the only thing you have to be aware of. That uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, but we'll see later on how to build your router, etc. Okay, and incrementally we will cover that part also. How this uh, HTML5 uh, push-based routing works? How does this uh, URL? Maybe some of that will be covered in the video as well. Okay, but we'll be talking about that. So apart from this, any other questions? Okay, any open questions or any concept that is not clear? And some of you might also might also have gone through that um, JavaScript for Elixir as well, I suppose, right? Let me know in the chat window. At least one glance on it. Hey, Rajesh. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have some doubt on Elixir. So uh, should I tell now or like later in the session? Uh, you can ask the question, and maybe we'll cover at the appropriate time. Okay, but question is good to put through, yeah. Yeah. So I'll just copy paste one piece of code uh, that I wrote. Okay. Yeah, I'll just. Okay. So this is a map, and. Uh, what I'm basically doing is ki I'm getting the sum of all uh, ages. Mm -hmm. Okay, this basically I'm doing. So first I'm filtering according to the ages and then like I go forward and do enum dot sum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and uh, the other way I used was uh, the reduce function. Okay. 
so this is this is this is giving you the correct output yeah yeah both are giving me the correct output uh, okay. but the thing is ki in reduce function means just before reduce function uh, i'm doing enum dot map on that particular thing so uh, this to is working because uh, i have a key value pair right hmm correct and the enum dot reduce function means the basically i had the problem in enum dot reduce i means i didn't get the syntax what's happening okay in fact the reduce syntax is exactly same to the reduce that we did in javascript okay remember what is the parameter that we needed in the javascript for the reduce part so when we call the reduce part the reduce you can give in a function as a parameter right that takes three or four values remember mm -hmm. okay and also we can pass in an initializer yeah so zero remember? is the initializer correct so here zero is the initializer mm -hmm. okay and then you are kind of passing in the rest of the parameters to it but the difference only in in here is uh, since uh, uh, we are uh, using here the pipe right so the first actually the first parameter here is uh, the li list itself the array itself yeah. correct and then you have the fn and then you have that accumulate accumulation that is kind of happening in your application right and that function uh, uh, that you have in here where what's the name of that function it's fn right fn yeah. no, sorry no no not that fn is that anonymous function and it takes in an n as a parameter correct and what you are doing in here is you are turning n plus n plus accumulator right and then accumulator is the parameter and you are simply accumulating the n, n here so, so what, uh, what will happen uh, is in the initial thing when you pass zero that zero should be passed as an accumulator acha okay Okay, so, and then it will be. So, when n is basically uh, like just the basic syntax, right? Correct, correct, correct. So we'll oh, be talking okay. talking about that syntax okay. in detail. Okay. okay. So when you pass in a anonymous lambda function, right? So we write fn f fn and the parameter it takes, and after the arrow part is the return value. Hmm hmm hmm. Very good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Okay. Great. So any other questions? Anyone? Okay, so if no questions are there, let's start with Elixir. And uh, before I start with the coding, right, let me give you some background information of the Elixir as well. Okay, the nature of the language as such. Because see, at this point in time, I am very sure that um, uh, just a minute, huh? you might have at least went through this once, right? And you have a fair idea about the syntax. Okay, so not in very very detail, of course, yeah, but at least a fair decent idea. And many of you may be able to map from JavaScript to Elixir, right? Is that assumption correct? So there, there could be certain queries, definitely. That's okay. But fundamentally, you realize, okay, whatever you did in JavaScript is directly mapped to Elixir, right? The syntax may slightly change. Okay, is that assumption correct, everyone? Okay. So now let's go to some theory part, and then let's come back to the uh, actual coding part in here. What is the nature of Elixir as such, right? The one thing that we need to be aware of this Elixir. Okay, it's Elixir. Let me just type it down. Elixir, okay, it's a dynamically typed language. Okay, so there is a dynamically typed language, and there is also statically typed language as well. Statically typed, okay, like your uh, Java, C sharp, maybe some other languages, C plus plus. Okay, they are statically typed language. Okay, but Elixir is dynamically typed, right? Just like your JavaScript. Okay, this is one one thing that we need to be aware of. Okay, this the significance of dynamically typed language is the data type, right? That you have data types. Okay, they are not determined at compile time, but they are determined at run time. Okay, so there are advantages and disadvantages. What what are the disadvantages? Okay, certain errors will happen at runtime because we are not catching that error at compile time, right? So what is the benefit of statically typed languages? Many of the type errors are kind of captured at compile time itself. Okay, just be aware. Huh? There are sort because every language has its pros and cons, right? Okay, that's where uh, I'm just putting certain uh, the theoretical aspect of uh, Elixir in here. Okay, so dynamically typed. Okay, and data times are uh, kind of determined at runtime. Okay, so far um, everyone understands the difference between the statically and dynamically typed language from a very high level perspective. 
because many of you might have worked with uh, statically typed languages already. Just a second, uh, I think my machine hangs for a moment. I, uh, let me check whether I do. I need to do a restart or not. Okay, if it doesn't work, I'll do a restart one time. So let me know whether the screen is visible at this point in time. Okay, I may do a restart if needed. Okay, okay let's continue and if necessary, we will do a restart. Okay, so dynamically typed uh, languages, yeah, things are determined at a runtime. Okay, and this is a trade-off. Okay, and that uh, typically, typically we take. And more importantly, what is the second essential feature? Elixir is a functional programming language. Okay, that means it is declarative. It prefers to be declarative. Okay, and uh, your traditional statically type languages, right? These are imperative. That means you explicitly specify everything in here. And here you specify the intention of what needs to be done. But typically, whenever you think about functional programming language, if the functions are first class citizens, right? And uh, and uh, and where we typically kind of prefer a declarative style of programming, where we specify what is to be done rather than focusing on how to do it. That's very, very important. Okay, so declarative means you are focusing on what rather than how. Okay, that's kind of the significance between a declarative and an imperative programming language, right? Because when you have to write a loop in an imperative programming language, you have to specify a for loop, a while loop, i equal to zero, i less than, you actually specify how, right? Kind of in there. But in Elixir, we typically prefer the what part. And no, not the how part. Okay, we simply express our intent to do certain things and we call the functions and the functions will take care of rest of the things in there. In fact, you will see the beauty of that concept shortly as we go into more advanced code. Okay, and this could be new to many of you as well. The other thing, the Elixir itself is a kind of platform, right? So Elixir is a language, definitely. Okay, but Elixir as a platform, okay, it kind of runs on a Erlang virtual machine. Okay, this is also important. Okay, just like your Java has JVM, right? .NET has a runtime, .NET runtime, right? Uh, not exactly .NET. Uh, the C sharp maybe. That's a .NET runtime, right? Similarly, Elixir has the Erlang VM. Okay, and this VM is actually called as Beam. That's kind of a full form, but I'll figure it out because it's not no longer used. Okay, so Elixir runs on Erlang. Now, the beauty of this Elixir language is Erlang is kind of very, very old, actually, right? More than 30, 40 years, kind of. Okay, and it has a lot of built-in functions, built-in modules and functions available. Okay, that can be directly used in Elixir, if need be. 
So this is where the power of Elixir will come into play. It can reuse things from the already robust Erlang system. Okay, and the code that is written and executed in the Erlang is kind of very, very robust, very, very can be executed concurrently and is kind of very resilient. Okay, so there's a lot of good optimization that can be done in here. So other thing that we need to be aware of is the additional functionalities or libraries that this Erlang VM uses, right? It's actually classified as OTP. Okay, now this abbreviation doesn't matter. It actually used to stand for, okay, let me just put it here. It, it used to stand for Open Telecommunications Platform. This is the original meaning, but no longer valid. OK, it's, it's used actually in other areas apart from telecommunication. So OTP, whenever you hear the term OTP, right? Simply, it's kind of a collection of reusable codes, modules, et cetera, for all kind of solutions, not only telecom, but can be used in other areas as well. But the name survived. That's why you will still get the name OTP. OK, it is just a collection of goodness that can be used in Erlang as well as Elixir. So is this part clear to everyone so far, the ecosystem? Let me know. So apart from this, so other important aspect uh, of Elixir that we need to be account for is concurrency. scalability okay, and robustness. These things are built into Erlang. Okay, and this is very important. That's why Erlang is kind of gaining um, more adoption in recent times. Okay, and of course, we already know the data is immutable, right? Uh, in most of the programming language, but there's a slight difference, okay? Erlang, Erlang, behave slightly different okay uh, with respect to elixir okay we'll talk about that part it's only for convenience elixir has adopted a change which will make developers life easy but erlang is very very strict okay so i'll come to that point shortly kind of now the thing here is all these things like concurrency scalability and robustness robustness right there are some more other features in the language that helps you to achieve this Okay, for example, just to iterate for now, this concurrency, right? Uh, Erlang has an implementation of actor model. Okay, this is typically being used. Okay, and actor is nothing but a lightweight process. Okay, that is kind of independently executed. Okay, it's like a virtual. It's like a virtual process in the virtual machine and not an operating system process. Okay, and we can run hundreds and thousands of this on a single Erlang machine. Okay, and this allows high degree of concurrency since all these processes runs independently. Okay, and there's a provision that each of these can communicate with each other also because that is the design, that is by design. All these processes can have inter-process communication as well. Okay, and the inter-process communication happens through what is known as messages. Okay, so messages, a process can pass message to another process and vice versa. This is how communication happens. Okay, and this can run on same machine, this can run on different machine. That is how Erlang is designed and based on that, Elixir has the same adoption. Okay, that is how concurrency is achieved. Okay, and robustness, on the other hand, is achieved by something known as a supervisor. Just a second, I think again it hanged. 
Okay, so let, let me know. Is the concurrency part uh, idea clear, everyone? Not technical detail, but from an idea perspective. Okay. Okay. Now robustness. For some reason, this this is not working. Just a second now. Okay, so for robustness, we have something called as supervisors. Okay, that is again built into our lang. Okay, so we have something called as supervisor. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing at this point, but these things are already built into El Elixir, and these supervisors they monitor the Elixir processes. Okay, and if there is a bad process which crashes, right, the supervisors can simply restart them. And there's a reason this Elixir systems can run for year on year because robustness is built into the system. Uh, can you repeat, Rajesh? Yeah, so robustness in Elixir is kind of achieved by something called as supervisors. Okay, and these supervisors monitors all the processes, right? Because in Erlang on Elixir, everything is a process, right? That is getting executed. And if something bad happens to this process, or if the processes say crash, we don't have to worry because the supervisor will automatically restart them. Okay, okay. Okay, and there's a reason Elixir system is kind of immortal, right? Immortal immortality because it appears that the elixir system never dies because even if it dies, it spawns back to life. Okay, and that's the beauty of the Erlang language, which elixir has adopted. Okay, this is this kind of feature is not available in any other language as such. You have to implement it, right? But Erlang has it. It is built in. Yeah, it is built in. So it's a language, so it hardly crashes. It's a core feature of. Okay, yeah, but where something is very, very, very unexceptional happened, then it could crash, but hardly it it has happened. Okay, it's like uh, you have implemented something in your operating system, right? Uh, which is the core feature, and what if that core feature crashes? Yeah, then everything will crash. Okay, but that that hardly happens. We all know that, right? Those are exceptional situations. We can write our own supervisors also probably, and if we write it badly, things may crash. Okay, but this is kind of the core actually, core of um, uh, the matter. So we already have all these things built into Erlang, which is being kind of made available to Elixir as well. Okay, and we already know that um, uh, functional programming we have immutable data. Okay, so we'll talk more about immutability at a later point in time. Okay, whenever we modify any existing data, actually a new data structure is created. Okay, that's kind of a thing we need to be aware of in with respect to immutability. Okay, let me check my uh, whether my pen is kind of working. Okay, I think this this gives you a, a fair idea about how these Erlang systems are there. Okay, let me uh, for a moment. I'll. Uh, I may have to restart. I think. Okay, just a second. Huh? I'm just restarting this pen for a moment. Okay. So we have this thing, which will come later on. Okay, and uh, we also have something um, called as garbage collection built into Elixir.
and what is garbage collection since we know that data is immutable right in elixir right many of that data will be unreferenced because every time you make changes to an existing variable or anything like that actually a new variable is created right so elixir has inbuilt garbage collection mechanism it just like uh, other languages like dotnet and uh, jvm right so they identify what part of the system is not used right and things will be at automatically deallocated and cleared instead of we having to manually do that part right that is taken care by garbage collection okay and it is an internal process we don't have to uh, worry about that it automatically kicks in at the right time depending on the need of the system okay and it will kind of execute this algorithm so that things if they are unused will be cleared so these are all the benefits of erlang okay the other most 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 important thing is um, since we all we are also talking about concurrency and scalability right so elixir has the advantage that code tends to be distributed among multiple virtual processes okay that's that's the reason it's kind of concurrent we can have things running concurrently on different processes as well okay and the garbage collector can actually collect garbage on each of the process individually rather than the whole system remember the garbage collection is usually slow in many languages right because typically they work work on the whole system but on elixir we have the added advantage that the system can run garbage collection on individual processes rather than the whole system at a time because that because if your system is in a running state and if garbage collection happens it can slow down your system okay so elixir does some optimization on that front as well okay and of course um, since uh, uh, every language has a trade off right so elixir is good for many things but it's also not good for many other things okay that's kind of an important thing to be aware of and what are the things elixir that is not good at right elixir is typically not good at cpu intensive activities okay that's why elixir is kind of slower on that front okay i o said input output uh, uh, front it will be very very fast because it has concurrency built into the system okay if you are uh, doing something with cpu efficiency like you are building your own operating system or maybe a game engine then elixir is not for you you may have to go with golang rust or c++ but if you how to build a network game engine yeah you can use elixir because of concurrency right so certain parts of the application has to be written in another language certain part of it can be written in elixir okay so that's kind of the trade off that we have to do but in typical web application right or any application where in um, uh, io is more critical than cpu intensive applications elixir shines kind of okay and the beauty of elixir as we all know right we can uh, kind of use uh, it has interoperability for other languages as well and more language support is being added so that typically shine will shine out eventually in future but for most of the tasks that we are doing 90% of the cases elixir will work where elixir don't work we actually either may move to python or java, de depending on what you are doing maybe if you are doing image processing and computing right so you can go with java python or something else depending on the scenario but other 90% of the things it will be elixir okay i, I think you got the fair idea right at least because it's not not every language is suited for everything correct but yeah but elixir is suited for the majority of the work we are doing and wherever it is not the right choice we have a different choice okay elixir is suited for io for primary reason is that io is a network operation mostly right it interacting with the hard disk or it it's kind of interacting with a uh, with a network right and there is no cpu activities happening when you do io that's why it's kind of optimized okay and the other thing is you can concurrently make this request hundreds and thousands of requests and it can easily serve thousands of pages because they're simply accessing the disk correct so that's kind of very very fast okay the reason it's not optimized optimized for uh, cpu is by design it's actually kind of by a uh, design see whenever you have a language right there is always a trade off that typically happens the same issue we have with node js also node js is very very good for io operation but it's not good for cpu operation but see it's not that okay it's not that you cannot you cannot do cpu intensive activities in uh, erlang or elixir right you have to explicitly design your system in such a way that all your cores will be used 
Okay, by default it may or may not. It depends on the scenario that you are addressing. Okay, so those things you will eventually uh, you eventually uh, face, and you will realize okay, this is the kind of reason. It's kind of very very theoretical at this point in time. Okay. So Elixir process is nothing but an independent piece of code that is executed that has its own process ID, which can be independently managed. That's it. A process is a unit of execution. This is clear, Shivanshu. That means you can independently have many processes, right? It's not the exact same as a thread, yeah, because multi-threading is a different thing. Okay, and processing is a different thing. A thread can spawn multiple processes. Okay, and the process is an application. Okay, so all those connections uh, will be there. Okay, now I think now, uh, yeah, this this kind of gives you a very, very good idea about what Elixir is all about, right? From a very high level as well. Okay, let me know, is this uh, overview, overall idea clear? Okay, I'll be sending the reading materials, okay? And that will that you will be able to connect to. Okay, all these things will get connected. Okay, and when you start building applications, you will understand what is supervisors, okay, what is this immutability, okay, why it is important, okay, what is scalability, right? And how you can have this uh, immortal Elixir application, right? And how, how all those things are kind of working. Okay, so let me know whether so far uh, the overall idea is clear to everyone. Okay, just keep your mind open and and it's not so much yes, are terms here, right? Okay, this is why, this is why. Okay, more detail, yeah, we will get it uh, through the readings and discussions, kind of. But at least you have a very very fair idea. Now, certain other uh, important things uh, you may have to deal with, right? Uh, when you work with this Elixir applications, is uh, typically data versus functions. Correct? Because in object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming, right? So data is combined with functions. We already know. Okay. But in functional programming, data and functions are strictly separate. Okay. You can still group them. You can still group them. You can still group them in modules. Okay. Logical grouping. You can still do. Okay, and functions live on their own actually. Although related functions can be grouped as I mentioned. Okay, and functions are first class citizen, right? They can be directly used. They can be passed as a parameter. They can be written from a function. Right? They can. Those are nothing but. Yeah, it's it's built into the system. Okay, so this is kind of a common thing that we all need to be aware of. Then there's something about side effects, right? So we always talk about right pure functions and the side effects. So what what is what exactly is a side effect, right? So a side effect is where a function affects something outside of itself. That's the only thing you have to know, right? If if whatever the function does, it affects outside of the function, maybe an external resource, maybe a database, that is actually a side effect. Okay, the functions with side effects will typically do things like modify shared data that wasn't passed to it, right? Something which is normal for object-oriented code. And functions with side effects can also affect the environment by reading input data and producing output data, sending data over the network. Okay, but remember, the side effects are part of a system, right? So we need these side effects. Okay, and we will be doing this at the right place at the right time as needed. Okay, most of the time when we talk about Elixir, we always talk about avoiding side effects where possible. Avoiding side effects and mutating the data, etc. We are avoiding. But where database calls has to be made, it will be made. Where a network connection has to be established, it will be established. Okay, because you cannot build a pure system. 
you will always have a system with some side effects. Okay, that's kind of the reality. Because a program that clearly has no side effect, right, would be pretty much useless. Everyone agrees with that statement? Eh? Let me know. Because, of course, a program will have some side effect, right? So we have to maintain a balance between the two, pure functions and impure functions. Because say, what if you are building a program which cannot write to database, which cannot talk over the network? Do you think that kind of applications will be useful? Let me know. Right? So if, when someone says, right, a pure function, that that's kind of a design principle, a design pattern we are talking about. OK, there will be the side effects. And that should happen at the right place at the right time. Okay, but mutation will never happen. Okay, in Elixir, even though you may feel that we are mutating the data, that's simply because Elixir has made it for developer convenience. But we are actually not mutating the data. Okay, we'll talk about that point. First, uh, first class functions we already talked about, right? So functional programming kind of needs to have functions that are first class that are first class citizens of the language. Functions should be able to pass around that we already know. They can be simply passed around, just like a variable. Or they can be assigned to a variable as well. JavaScript is similar. Okay. The other important aspect of functions are they are composable. Okay. So when you think about functions, okay, these are small, typically, and they can be composed. They are composable. Okay, that's how reusability is created and clean clean coding is achieved in a functional programming language. Okay. And typically you set up a data pipeline. We'll be talking about that. How it works. Where set of data goes through a set of simple transformation. Okay, and you get a final output. Okay, some of you might have indirectly used pipeline operator also at this point in time. Okay, and the other important thing in this functional programming language is we already talked about this higher order functions. Okay, can anyone tell me what is a higher order function based on your JavaScript knowledge as well? Functions within functions. Mm. Not exactly, but can someone correct that? Uh, like basically, a function can be passed as an argument to other functions. Correct. Correct. Either as an argument or it can be a written value. Okay, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, that's what a high order function is all about, right? So you have a function a, wherein you are passing a result of function f, which is having a result of function g, right? function function you are simply passing okay function can be passed and written okay, very very common okay available in c sharp available in java also available in javascript as well but those were the secondary thoughts okay those features were added later in those languages but in elixir those things are by design okay it's kind of built into the language itself Okay, so the moment you start using map, reduce, etc., right? All these things will become kind of very, very clear. Okay, so this is why we need to under this is why, in fact, we spent some time with JavaScript first. The reason was simply because you have a very, very fair idea of map, reduce, okay, the concept of functions, the concept of anonymous functions, right? The concept of lambda functions, which is short notations for anonymous functions, right, and things like that. Okay. Composable simply means Parikshit combined. One or more functions can be combined to create a new transformation. That's what composition means. Okay. So designed by composition, designed by inheritance. When we talk, think about in terms of object-oriented programming, right? So many people use it designed by inheritance, which is not correct actually. Not always correct, I would say. You also have to need, need to use compositions there. 
Okay. Okay. Now I think we have um, uh, a bit of enough theory. Okay. A couple of more things. Okay. There is a uh, so elixir as such, right? It's a huge topic. Okay. Huge topic. There will be a lot of involvement um, needed from your side. Okay. To make it uh, fruitful. To make the learning fruitful eventually. Okay. Because no one can learn elixir in two days, three days, one week, two week. You. Make it familiar with the language in two days, three days, four days, five days. But to master the language, you should at least spend about 60 days of daily coding. Okay, that can only be done by you. Everyone agrees with me on that part? Okay, because when you learn a language, things will become very easy, right? But the thing is, if you don't revisit the language, syntax become weird over a period of time. And you will always struggle with the language. So our goal should be to be in touch with the language as much as possible, build things out, write more code, see a problem statement, and try to solve it in Elixir and JavaScript parallelly, possibly. Okay, so that both those languages are very, very good. Remember, remember one more thing: no matter how many languages you learn in your tenure as an IT engineer, right? Always master at least one language very, very, very thoroughly. So when I, when I say very thoroughly, you have to go deep into that language. And maybe you may use some other language over a period of time, right? But that's just as an application. Okay, that's that's a goal you should always keep in mind because you cannot master all the language at the same time. Eventually you will. Okay, that's one more thing. Okay, so there will be some resources and uh, uh, books that I'll be sharing. And uh, uh, after the sessions, right, along with the recordings um, that uh, will be uploaded, I'll be sharing some links to YouTube videos. Uh, but it won't be my videos because I haven't yet recorded Elixir as such yet. Yet, okay. So I'll be sharing some videos that I think are very good, okay, and which will be kind of hands-on, and you will learn a lot more because there are infinite videos. But I'll be sharing the thing, sharing the one that I think will be adding more value to your learnings in Elixir. Okay, and whenever I publish a video, I'll I'll, I'll keep you posted. Uh, typically, that publishing happens when I am on a leave or a holiday or Sunday, right? That's the only time I can record and publish videos. So yeah, that will happen eventually. Okay, yeah, but the priority you already know, right? Revise JavaScript, start with Elixir. Okay, practice all the exercises. Okay, do all the coding, and uh, watch and code. From whatever video that I share with you. Okay, so let's get to the coding now, and after that we'll take a short break. Okay, and uh, we'll have a second session. So day one for Elixir, I will be keeping it very simple and very concise. Um, okay, part one of the sessions, but part three of the sessions will be kind of going into a lot of details, okay, coding and uh, uh, different use cases kind of thing in there. So before we uh, go in there, let's kind of simply start Elixir for a moment. Uh, let me just bring up a terminal. OK, I hope by this time, uh, everyone already has Elixir installed onto your respective machine, right? That's kind of an important thing. OK, so let me talk about certain uh, Conventions actually before we do any other thing. So, as a primary reference point, okay, so this is what you will be using. Okay, the Elixir's official documentation. Okay, and also I think I shared one more thing, uh, one more thing with all of you, right? Which is Elixir School. Okay, these two are your starting point. Take care, everyone. So we will be time and again uh, referencing this uh, just, just to ensure that we have a logical sequence to follow. OK, but it has a lot of materials in here, right? And we'll be also referencing this, the official documentation, so that the basic syntaxes are clear. And our goal will be to kind of do something from here and also talk about it. OK, why it, why it is working in that way in certain scenarios, right? So those things can be. Uh, discussed. 
So let me come back to this IEX for a moment, right? We already know that this is an interactive Elixir terminal, right? So when you type in IEX, you will actually go into an a repel of Elixir. Okay, wherein you can type in certain Elixir commands. Okay, and start working with Elixir, right? Immediately, without kind of uh, setting up any IDs and things like that. Eventually, which we'll be doing. Okay, and here you can write a valid Elixir command. This is integer. This an integer, which is in hexadecimal format. This is an integer in float format. This is a boolean, okay, which is true or false. This is an atom. Atom begins with a colon, right? And atom is nothing but it's a symbol representing the same value. It's it's like a string, but it's a symbol. Internally, it optimizes the memory. Okay, and they are very very useful for lookup. Okay, you can create any atoms like this. A very useful uh, uh, thing to know about. We'll we'll see. Uh, whenever we make a request to an API, right? We will be getting these responses back as atom. So we will immediately recognize these are atoms. Okay, and this is a string. Okay, and this is character. In single code means character. Double quotes means string. Okay, just keep that point in mind. Small point will come. Uh, we'll talk about that. Okay. Arrays are called as list in Elixir. So this is a list or array. And tuple is nothing but a but a thing that you put in curly braces. It, it typically is a collection, kind of collection, which has three values. It can have more possibly, but typically it has three values. This is kind of a very, very uh, uh, basic thing, actually. I think this this part you already know, right? Let me know in the chat window. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. But but we'll we'll see how it works. Okay. For example, a equal to one, two, three. B equal to one two three. A equal to B one two three. Right? They are same almost. But we'll talk about that part. Is this clear, Vikram? Okay. Now, so first part is yeah, we we know certain basic stuff in Elixir, right? And we can do certain mathematical operations on it if needed. One plus two. I'm just kind of refreshing things out. Okay. Just so that we are comfortable with this en environment, okay. multiplication, division. I think for division, you are also a div, a div so function already available. Similarly, other functions are also available. Okay, for example, for model modulus operator, many languages many languages have this modulus operator to get the remainder, right? Here we can use rem. Okay, zero, right? M one remainder one. Okay, you can. This parenthesis is optional, actually. Okay, so you can simply type it like this without parenthesis. This this thing is not supported in other languages, right? So wherever this ambiguity, you have to use parenthesis. You can use parenthesis. Is this clear so far, everyone? Okay, and you can create binary uh, binaries by using zero b. And now whatever you put is binary. Okay, and hex can be zero x. That is for hexadecimal. And o for octal. This will be octal. Okay, I'm just putting it down. Now we are not going into details of their number systems yet. Okay, and then there are already built-in functions that will work with this number, right? So round closes integer to a given float, actually. So 3.58 closes integer of the float will be 4. Okay, and we can also use truncate, which will give you the integer part of the float so what is the integer part of this float can anyone tell me integer part of 
absolutely right three uh, what is room manish <laughs> as a floor okay correct yeah no 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 issues no issues okay now we can also get the help for functions actually now i remember in elixir functions have arity and in fact every everything functions have arity arity means how many parameters are there right that is what is known as arity let me just put it down here arity means the number of parameters okay but elixir has this built in support wherein that number of parameters plays a very very critical role okay and you can get the help for many of the functions by its parameters okay because polymorphism in functional prototype is achieved through what is known as protocol wherein we can have the same functions with different signatures okay for example we already know this truncate function right here so if i would like to check help on the truncate i can simply type h and truncate it it will give me a detailed definition but i could also do h and truncate with an arity of 1 so it will give you more information depending on if there any changes are there or not okay so it's actually printing the documentation for the truncate function with an arity of 1 arity means one parameter okay and you can use this for uh, any method actually okay and this is quite quite handy now you might think where is this truncate function coming right we haven't loaded any module etc so where is this truncate function these functions are defined in the kernel what okay, is the core of the language so it is, this is as, as same as h of kernel module dot truncate with an arity of 1 so things which are already defined in the kernel is automatically available in all parts of elixir code now we don't have to explicitly load the kernel module okay that's why certain functions you can directly use it and you can later on take a look at the kernel documentation and you will get all the familiar names there okay elixir supports uh, boolean right so true false true equal to false it's something like that and we have certain predicate functions which can check whether the input is boolean or not okay what is a predicate function typically whenever you hear the term predicate simply means the function returns a boolean true or false okay so there's a function called is boolean okay which will check whether the input is a boolean or not i could do a help on is boolean i could do a help on is boolean with a one arity returns true if the term is either the atom true or the atom false okay otherwise returns false allowed in guard test inlined by the compiler okay some information is there okay again we are just getting used to certain functions so i could say is boolean say true and the result should be true is boolean say one so in javascript and other languages anything other than null or undefined is a true but in elixir it is not okay but if i say is boolean say the atom true it will get true because atoms is booleans have the representative atoms as well okay so similarly there is a function called is float you can do a help on is float with an arity of 1 and this will tell you what it does or if it's a floating point number or not right so maybe is float okay 
So you get the answer false, right? Because this is not a floating point number. But if I say is float 10.5, you get true. Okay, you can use a parenthesis also. But we know this is kind of optional. Yes, so far, everyone. Okay, we'll talk about the guard clauses, Mayanka. We'll we'll come to that point. We we haven't yet talked about the guard guard clause. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so there, these are certain new features in Elixir which other programming languages doesn't have. Okay, so far is this clear, everyone? Okay, again, very very basic, and this could be uh, a refreshing uh, things to do uh, things for you because you might have gone through some of this already. But we are just talking about some more things as we do it. Okay, and the atoms we already know. This will not work, right? Because if you have spaces in the atom, that should be within double quotes. Just I'm just showing you a demo. Okay, and an atom apple is equal to an atom apple. So there's only one reference to a specific atom that you create. Okay, and an atom apple will not be equal to an atom orange, right? Because both are different objects in memory. Sometimes I will use the term object so that you are able to relate to it. Then all these things typically, all the uh, uh, types in Elixir typically goes into heap and stack as applicable. So one thing that you might have noticed here is the Boolean thing true has an equivalent atom true. So true is equal to true. Similarly, false is equal to the atom false. Okay, these are just for uh, convenience. They are kept. Okay, so if you see this, they are the same. And uh, string we already know, right? We can store an atom into a string as well. That's just a variable for us. Okay, and we can interpolate it. Hello. Remember interpolation in JavaScript also, right? We use backtick and dollar sign. Here we use the hash and the curly braces. Can in Elixir things can also have line breaks as well. Okay, so those are things uh, we need to be aware of. So many times you will be using a lot of uh, intermediate functions for testing your application, like uh, uh, this, which prints values onto the screen. Similarly, you also have the inspect, will, which will print out the raw value, I suppose. OK, so it's inspect will be kind of uh, giving you some pretty printing as well. These are some common utility function that you will be using. Okay, we can also get the number of bytes in a string. So if you have a string, whatever string you have, Rajesh, right? Maybe you can get the byte size using the byte size function. It's six, right? Okay, and you can use helper methods on the string module and get the length of the name here. Okay, again, six. Some common usage I'm talking about. See, in object-oriented programming, you would have said name dot length. Because data and functions live together, right? But in functional programming, you will use the module Okay, related module and use the group function, whatever I have, and then pass in the appropriate 
variable. Okay, you will see a lot of use with enum functions later on, which is enumerator, which works with your list and array. When in doubt, always use this h command, and you will get a lot of detailed help. There's not no, not even need to go to go for the go go into the internet and search for things. Right, directly from the terminal, you can get information about most of the things. Okay, so this is again foundational uh, thing we already know. And then we have now the most important part, which is where confusion happens, right? So let's talk about that a bit. Now, when you see things like this, in many languages, this is assignment. Okay. This is assignment in other languages. This is what we think. Okay, but in Elixir, treat it like Treat it like an assertion. Assertion means whether the thing is matching. Thing on the right side is matching with that on the left side. So this is the difference, actually. Now, when you say that data is immutable, right, in Elixir, so how is am I how 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 am I able to change this, right? From name Elixir to say Erlang. This is what confuses many people. This is clear, everyone. This this is this question still many people might have, right? Okay, now this will not work in Erlang. Okay, Erlang will not not allow you to do this. Erlang will say no, no, no. You 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 cannot do this. But Elixir is allowing it, right? So does that mean Elixir is mutating the data? Definitely not. So typically what is happening in here is when you declared name equal to Elixir, a pattern match happened. And it figured out left hand side we have a variable and right hand style we have a constant kind of thing. So it simply bind this Elixir string to the name. That means in memory, definitely. An object called name is created. Okay. And that may have the string elixir at certain memory location here, right? Okay. Now, when I say name equal to Erlang, this doesn't mean that elixir will go to this memory location, change this elixir. And change this to Erlang. If this happens, this is data mutating. But Elixir doesn't do this. Okay, what Elixir Elixir does is so when you when you have a name with some memory representation address, and you have the value, and since the left hand side is a variable, this string is bounded. to the variable on the left hand side, right? Because we had a variable here. And when you again say name is equal to Erlang, a new memory location is created called name okay, with some new address. And the value Erlang is stored there. And this one will be garbage collected. Now you got the idea, everyone, what is exactly happening? So this is Elixir feature. For convenience of the developers, they added this. Otherwise, it will, it becomes very difficult to do simple assignments, right? Let me know whether this is clear. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about functional programming, like I read this on the internet. So one of the core concepts is like immutability, and another is referential transparency. So can we say that uh, Elixir like maintains the uh, immutability thing, but not the referential transparency thing? Okay. So, so why do you think Elixir is not 
maintaining the referential transparent transparency. Uh, referential transparency thing means that uh, once some variable reference like has a reference of some variable like in this case let's say name is having the reference of elixir initially but Correct. later on in the program the reference changes to erline so it is referentially opaque right but uh, if we have referential transparency all like once a variable is defined all further uh, like like whenever we are using that variable in future we can always replace the variable with the initial value which mm -hmm. we cannot do in elixir like no. as it looks right now no we can we can actually so referential transparency doesn't mean exactly that so typically okay. referential transparency simply means that let me just put a so you have an expression, right? Uh, you, it can be anything. It can be a value or uh, whatever, right? Uh, okay, so you have something, okay, which can be replaced by its value. Say this is name, name equal to x, y, z, right? Correct. Okay, and if you have a function, okay, def function maybe I'll say def, which takes in a name and does something. Okay, so wherever this name is taken and where the condition of x, y, z is there, right? This name can be replaced by x, y, z in Elixir and that works. Okay, so we'll see that in example, how it kind of actually works. So this simply means an expression like name may be replaced by its value. And what is the value x, y, z? This is clear everyone so far? This is the name. This is the value, right? So wherever name is there, right? It can be replaced by this value, which is not available in any other programming language. It's only available in functional programming language and which is available in Elixir as well. Okay, so we'll talk about this also. This is clear so far? Just let me know. Okay, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, kind of uh, also maybe check out where it slightly may differ, but it, it will work most of the time. Okay, so all, all functional programming languages will support this referential transparency. Okay, simply substituting a function call with a given set of parameters. That's that's what the meaning of this is all about. Okay. So when the example comes right, this will become more clear now. Okay. Right now, yeah. From a theoretic perspective, wherever function have is expecting a parameter name. Okay, and it it has some behavior based on the value of that name. This name parameter can be replaced by this value directly also, and that is a polymorphic function where a protocol is involved. Okay, so it will become too much of theory, theory at this point in time. But I, I think you you all got the idea, right? Let me open up a Wikipedia definition also just to clarify this point. Okay, so that since uh, you might be referencing, uh, so let, let me just check it out. So if you come back to this, no, there are multiple things. Uh, let me just talk about the generic part here. Okay, now see, in a functional programming, referential transparency is generally defined as the fact that an expression, this is important, okay, expression uh, in a program may be replaced by the value or anything having the same value without changing the result of the program. So these two things are important and the expressions is replaced by its value. This doesn't talk, this doesn't, this has nothing to do with uh, directly mutating a variable or anything like that. I have one question here. So yeah. uh, it says any expression, right? So suppose mm. I'm declaring X is equal to one in Elixir. Mm -hmm. And then I'm writing x is equal to x plus one. Mm -hmm. So the value of x becomes two, right? A new bounded variable will be created where the value is two, correct? Y yes, but in this x is equal to x plus one, I cannot replace the value of x with the 
like i cannot replace the variable with the value it will make the expression see incorrect it it doesn't say any expression it says the concept of referential transpose is generally defined as the fact that an expression in a program the important part here is when you write that function definition that expression is defined already that is important huh? this doesn't mean you can pass in any ref any expression because then that could be different value right so what the meaning of this is if you have written somewhere in the logic wherein you have an expression okay which contains something okay and again this something is written what if instead of passing this expression directly you are passing the value of that expression will it work or not if the answer is yes it supports referential transparency if the answer is no it doesn't support referential transparency that simply means you can substitute a function call and a given set of parameters with a result the function would return okay that's why i said okay, uh, the moment you see the example this will become very very clear Okay, by this reading, and there could be a lot of ambiguity and confusion that will arise. But important thing to note when you read it out is two part here. One is an expression. Okay, may be replaced by its value, and the value replacement could happen because of the return of that function call or expression, return or evaluating the expression. Okay. Okay, don't think too much about this. अभी अभी के लिए इतना ही ध्यान में रखना है. Okay, what we need to keep in mind is yes. Okay, if you have an expression and uh, after evaluation, if you get some value, right? Or if it is a function and uh, after calling a function, you get some value. Okay, and those are interchangeable. Okay, that's what the meaning of this statement is. And mostly all functional programming language has support for referential transparency. Is this clear, everyone? At least, at least from the difference, what is being written in here, right? And the understanding that we are talking is not about k. If you are passing a, and then you are passing a plus one, no, it, it, it's not the meaning. Those are two different expressions. Okay, even though the result of the uh, uh, bounded value you are assigning it to the same variable. Okay, I'll I'll point to a correct URL later on. Okay, Abhi ke liye this this thing is this thing was important because this is the first result you get when you type in referential transparency. So I just uh, kind of took you through this. Okay. Okay. Okay, so from an overall perspective, you have a, a fair idea about uh, the language now. So when I say fair idea about the language, that essentially means you understand where this language is coming from. Okay, and what are the important parts of this language? Okay, and uh, Erlang and Elixir as a language is just one part of the system, right? You have something called a virtual machine also on which these things run, and there are a lot of goodness that is built into OTP okay, in the form of modules and functions. Okay, which is built on our lang, which can be directly used in the language. Okay, and we also saw some of the other parts of the systems like concurrency, resiliency, scalability, right? Where I mentioned that supervisor keeps the process running. Correct. So those those theoretical aspects also we kind of discussed. We had a quick look at um, IEX, the REPL read, evaluate, print, and loop. Um, Terminal program, right? In Elixir, where we, wherein we can directly try out the certain Elixir features, right? Without writing any lengthy code. Okay, and we also see that all the documentation for those functions are available directly from the command line. So, is this part clear to everyone so far? ठीक है ओके
just take a quick look in here. Let me show you a very quick example, actually, of referential transparency. Let me try whether I am able to show it. Okay, but we'll be talking more about it because this is the only point um, that you may still have certain uh, thing in here. I'll try to take a very simple example. Um, let's say we have a variable called greeting. Okay, so we have a variable called uh, greeting. I'm I'm now talking about variable. I know this is actually a ba variable binding behind the scene. There's a pattern matching involved, right? And since the left side is a variable and right side is a constant, hello world is being assigned, matched, and assigned to this variable called greeting. Okay, now let's say we have a variable called say reverse r1 equal to greeting. I'm not sure whether we have a reverse function. Let me check. Greeting. Yeah. Okay, so we have a greeting here, right? R2 is reverse greeting. Now, if you take a look at this simple variable declarations, see, simple things, what you are observing is greeting is hello world. OK, and then R1 contains string dot reverse of greeting. You are passing an expression. OK, and what does that expression contains? It contains hello world. OK, and R2 contains string dot reverse of greeting. Okay. Now, instead of this, if you had done, R1 equal to string dot reverse of hello world. Instead of an expression, you are replacing it with a value. This is what referential integrity is all about. They are the same. They are referentially transparent. Whether you pass in an expression or whether you pass the result of an expression. This is the basic premise of referential integrity. OK, now you think that it's both common, right? but we'll see these applications uh, where it kind of happens. But this is the meaning. Instead of passing in uh, expression greeting, does the meaning of this variable change as actually? If instead of greeting, you are passing in hello world, the string itself directly, it doesn't actually, right? They are referentially transparent. So here we can see that this variable is referentially transparent, even if we substitute the value of that variable that we are using, which is greeting, with the actual result. They are always the same, OK, no matter what. OK, and this kind of sometimes changes in the OOPS world because of data mutation, et cetera. Because here, mutation is not there, right? So we are guaranteed that things will remain sane and simple. So the theoretical definition of this statement that you saw here is this piece of code, string dot reverse greeting and string dot reverse hello world. Is this clear now, everyone? What is referential transparency? So where you're passing an expression, you are directly passing the result of the expression now, which is hello world. OK, and still, the reasoning will become very, very clear. There won't be any ambiguity in the re reasoning. Okay. Typically, when there is data mutation and something like that, there can be ambiguity because of various factors. Yeah, this will be useful in concurrency, actually. OK, because concurrency is where things, right, if mutated, may go wrong, right? You can have stale data. You can have broken things. But because of this concept, uh, Alexa will ensure that every process has a correct state maintained, because it cannot be corrupted in any form. Okay, and uh, it, 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 this referential uh, transparency now it support is actually kind of um, 
uh, applicable in many languages now, but more prominent to uh, FPs. Okay, so let's continue on this, and uh, I hope this is clear, right, everyone? At least you have an idea about what that uh, statement is meaning. Okay, let me take uh, one more thing in here, and uh, then I'll uh, uh, end up. So we have something um, uh, called as anonymous functions, right? We already know anonymous function in JavaScript. So what is an anonymous function definition? Can anyone tell me? Function without a name, right? So in Elixir, we have something called as anonymous function. And they, they are very useful and very powerful as well. OK, and this anonymous function, they help us to store and pass executable code. Just as if it was a variable, if it was a variable. That, that is what this anonymous, anonymous function does for Elixir. OK, and uh, they are delimited by, when you create anonymous function, they are delimited by the keyword function and end. So, so between this, the anonymous function goes. So now we'll realize why that syntax is there, right? Of anonymous function because they have to be delimited by fn and end. OK? So let's take a very quick example of this. So let's go back here. Let me clear the screen. OK, let's create. A, I'll take the example from the documentation itself. So fn a b and a plus b and end so you can see the result is an expression that is telling this is a function right and uh, the way it differs from other function is to invoke the anonymous function you have to use the dot operator here okay you cannot simply say add say one comma two this will not work because add is an undefined function add with the two parameters right but you have to say add dot one comma two that's how you execute the anonymous function. And then you can use this helper, right, is function to check whether this add is a function or not. And you get the result back. This is true. They are function. OK, and this function receives two parameters, right? So we can see the parameters are a comma b. You can also write this function in long form, right? So maybe add function a comma b a plus. And right, same thing. That function takes two parameters, right? So this is without parameters, and this is, I'm sorry, this is without uh, parentheses, and uh, the latest one here is with parentheses to make it clear. Because sometimes you may confuse with this integer. What is this, right? These are nothing but parameters. Okay, now this is more clear. So in case this is confusion, you can always use parentheses. So is this clear so far, everyone, on this anonymous function part? You can also verify our add function takes a uh, arity of two, right? You know what is arity? Can anyone tell me what is arity? Number of arguments. Correct. So add functions takes two arguments, right? I could verify that is function add that has two arguments. It it gives me true, but if I say is function add. Do we have a function add with the one one arity? False, because we don't have. Okay, so those things can be. These things are useful uh, uh, when we do meta programming in etc. Those are nothing but when you build your own libraries, right? A very very advanced topic kind of thing in here. But then these small functions will be of use. Yeah, hello Rajesh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so how is add an anonymous function if we have a name for it? Correct. Yes, so add is not an anonymous function here. No, we don't have a name. This is just a binding. Oh, 
okay. when you yeah name will only happen when you define a function with the def keyword okay. that's a name function okay any function that is not created using the def is theoretically a anonymous function now in javascript remember how did you create an anonymous function in javascript you simply had the function right with no name correct but how did you access the function you cannot you have to store that within a variable you know and then variable ko you can simply invoke it the only difference here is uh, elixir internally distinguishes between a name function and an anonymous function okay and anonymous function has to be invoked with a dot okay that's the only difference in here but they are first class objects you can simply pass around you can pass that anonymous function to something else in fact um, you can do something like this let's create a double function okay which is a function that takes one parameter and returns the double of that okay now it's a double c sorry sorry you have to pass in that dot right remember dot c it becomes 6 is clear everyone this is function composition no huh? here kind of in action because the double function is composed of the add function okay and it simply takes the parameter and doubles it out right okay so let me know this is clear still here and also referential transparency is minorly clear so far okay i won't say absolutely clear but you saw the difference right replacing your expression with the value of that expression right that is what referential transparency is all about okay so uh, let me take one more one more thing uh, and then i'll wind up for now and we'll break and catch up again okay now what is that one thing i would like to see is something called linked list it's not actually linked list we are creating yeah and what is a list list is nothing but arrays like arrays right but not exactly an array that's why i said it's like an array okay so something if we create this is a list in javascript this would be an array But the difference here is this is internally a representation of a linked list. That means it has a head and it has a tail. This kind of important thing. Okay, maybe I can uh, get that head here. Okay, and rest of the things can go into the tail. Okay, and I can say, let me create a variable first. This course. so some scores right let's create a variable with head and tail okay this is a pattern matching here head and tail okay and i'll put in the scores okay, syntax error right so extra parenthesis okay, now if you inspect the value of head this should be 10 if you inspect the value of tail this will be rest of the values okay so internally i just name it the head, head and tail you can name it anything actually you can name this anything first and rest okay yeah. first rest okay and this list operators uh, uh, in fact we haven't yet seen operators okay but uh, we will kind of shortly see uh, it is not o n o, o of one operation okay but it does some optimization it won't be o of n also it will be doing some internal optimization okay because these are references right they are never mutable na so uh, elixir is do it elixir is able to do it very very fast so even though it's, it's a linked list the optimization enables uh, in with logarithmic algorithm algorithm time okay not the order of n operations okay manish 
So it does this internal optimizations. Okay, and this list can be concatenated, and there are operators for that actually. Okay, in fact, uh, it's not like other languages where you can directly concatenate a string. So in fact, for example, I could not say this here. Hello, plus world, right? It will give me error like bad argument in arithmetic. In JavaScript, this would have worked. Okay, it, it might have automatically typecast it and it might have concatenated the string, right? In Elixir, for uh, concatenation of string, you have to use this less than greater than operator. So this will be a string concatenation operator. This is clear so far, everyone, how you can concatenate string. The typical plus operator will not work here. Similarly, if you have two lists, okay, you cannot add them like this. Uh, you have to use the double plus operator. So this is list concatenation. So one, two, three, and four, five, six. You will kind of get it. You can also subtract actually. So if you already have say one, two, three, four, five, and six, and if you subtract four, five, six, you will get one, two, three. Okay, there are certain other in important aspects like, say, if you already have this list, right? So what are the variable scores? Okay, so I could use a function called hd, hd, which is which stands for head, and pass in that scores, you get the head. Okay, or maybe if you pass in uh, tail, okay, there's nothing like a tail function, right? It has to be tails. Okay, if it is not there, you can create one. You can create one. Okay, let me check the name actually later on, what the name exactly is. Okay, it should be TL actually, not tail. You can alias it. Okay, so head will give you 10 and tail will give you 25, 9, and 3. Okay, these are simply function. Okay, so I'm mixing it. This is clear so far. There are a lot of uh, uh, built-in functions like this that typically works on list, maps, and enums. Uh, enums means it's an enumerator, right? You can it can be used with a map, or with a keyword list, or with a list. Okay, that's where enum uh, model will come into play. Okay, important thing to note is if you if you try to get the header head of an empty list, you will get an error. But there is no head in there, right? That's why. Okay, be, just be aware of certain things in here. Okay, and uh, let me cover one more thing in here. Just a second, uh, I'm just cross-checking. Okay, let's also talk about tuple because this is what you will be encountering in many of the Elixir function calls. Okay, and tuples are nothing but an ordered collection of anything but here we can simply use atoms and something else this this is tuple it typically goes within curly braces okay, you can have more thing in tu tuples okay and then there will be supporting functions that works with tuple or tuple whatever you call it actually uh, how do you pronounce it well, many people pronounce it differently actually do you call it as tuple or do you call it as tuple? Let me know. Tuple. Tuple, right? And anyone who calls it a tuple? Okay, there is a question here. Can other applications of linked list also be? Yeah. So with other applications of language, you mean inserting an element, removing an element, all those things? So 
sort of that's already built into okay i'll, I'll we'll do that okay so any collection that you have right whether it's a linked list whether it's a map there are equivalent uh, functions available that will do those operations including searching and all those things is already uh, built into it okay so this is this is kind of one example for example for this um uh, we have this okay and success right we have a couple size in here right this is again a method from the kernel and if you you can actually pass in a variable or maybe i am simply passing it the values here directly it will tell you the size is true or it's like a length actually too okay and you can also grab this because these are order sequences right that's kind of a difference so if you have something like something some couples here right it could get element of that specific couple right at that position you get cancel if you get if you do zero here you get the first element right negative indexes maybe not working here yeah okay i'll come to that part later on so yeah there are a lot of methods available with all these data structures and types that we have in elixir right and you can and certain methods are common to many times it actually understands how to deal with if the types are changed Okay, so it will accordingly work. For example, enum works with many types, right? But tuple size is specifically for tuple only. Okay, and uh, let's say we have a tuple in here. Okay, maybe we already have a tuple called something, and we may need to add something here, right? Maybe at certain location. So I can say put element at this something at the first location, and the information is I'm putting any information, right? And first location means zero one, right? So it should be the first location before cancel. So okay, I am here. Reject and submit. Okay, and the important thing here is not mutating this something. Okay, you are getting a new tuple back because if you still observe what is in the something, you will still get the old values because it will never mutate. This is important to note. So is this clear so far, everyone? So we have seen list. Okay, we have tuple, and there are other things in here. You might also some sometimes think about what is the difference between list and a tuple, then, right? It almost looks like same. Okay, but there's a slight difference actually. You will store always when you have to do something on the tuple, right? You have to create a new tuple. Like, and this is where the new values are available. Because in Elixir, we never mutate. We always get new objects back. Okay, but from a theoretical perspective, the main difference to observe with list and tuples are list. In Elixir, are linked list. Okay, so it has its problem. Even though Elixir optimizes it for performance reason, but many times it has to traverse through the entire list also. Okay, depending on what we are doing in there. Okay, and tuples are very memory efficient because they are stored in contiguous memory, like your arrays, right? Arrays are stored in contiguous memory, right? I suppose, right? If I'm right from the definition perspective. Okay, so tuples are also stored in contiguous memory location. Okay, this essentially means that getting the tuple size or accessing a tuple by the index, right, is much much faster. But updating or adding elements to the tuple is expensive because it requires creating a new tuple in memory. Okay, so there is slight performance issues, but those performance issues and memory issues are not very significant. You can put millions of 
objects in this tuple and elixir will work efficiently uh, unless you are short of ram that's a different story this is clear everyone okay, unless the machine itself is short on ram as a language as such elixir will optimize as much as possible this is clear so far let me know okay so can elixir get really inefficient and slow for long list of tuples due to immutability and uh, no because it does optimizations because because of immutability if things are not changing it it simply reference it and reuse it in certain ways in the most optimized way so those are internal implementations in fact elixir if you have very large computation elixir will still work without having any rounding issues as well that's a very good example maybe i'll show you later on how that happens other languages mostly crash actually but elixir will not crash okay you won't having any you won't be having any rounding issues as such okay, many languages have that issues okay so yeah we had some 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 quick review kind of thing in here this is clear so far everyone let me know the overview one important is the theory part that was important because practice you can in any case take a look at the documentation right and uh, you can start doing it okay, but more importantly the elixir ecosystem as such right how it is based on erlang Look okay, at the concept of compositions. Okay, the pattern matching we'll be talking about more. Okay, the basic types that are there in Elixir. Okay, is it clear, everyone? Uh, till here, till this point in time. is it recommended to always add elements at the start of an array for o1 time complexity not exactly any get okay because those things actually depend on your use cases okay what you are trying to achieve right it depends on that because this time complexity is so fast that right? you won't even notice is this clear any get why because in real applications right when you are building a web app or any app right you never show all the million records on the screen do, do you agree on this everyone we only show items in a compartment right like paginations we implement things like that for optimization right? so at any given point of time there will only be a minimum set of records to deal with this is clear right everyone why because no system can handle certain amount of data right beyond what ram provides okay that's why we have to do that additional optimizations in coding right no matter which language we use even if you create a linked list in any language like c++ also right you have to deal a lot with memory correct and your applications performance is totally dependent on how much ram you have no matter if it's c++ or java elixir it doesn't matter okay but the only difference being since this data structures are built into the language it uses the language features of concurrency etc to provide scale okay that's where things differ okay so maybe yeah we'll eventually see that part also one at a time okay but but i hope this this is clear right everyone so far the syntax of that anonymous function is as clear as well so this basic things is very accurate revision to all of you so that when you go to the documentation right things are very very clear as well okay and we can do uh, more practices later on with use cases once this fundamental things are done okay that's where we'll be going into some examples okay let just let me check one more thing in here huh? Uh, because i would like to give you something to practice okay 
Okay, since we already uh, talked about um, uh, the list, the tuples, okay, let's also uh, very quickly uh, take a look at the map as well. Okay, and maps are uh, the key value data structure in Elixir. That's kind of important to note. And maps are created using percentage curly braces. Okay, this is how you create a map in Elixir. This is hash is comment. Okay, so that's kind of a center. This is an empty map. This is an empty map. So this is like your dictionary or hash in other programming languages. Okay, and you can create a map in multiple ways. One is yeah, you can kind of uh, put your key value pair within this parenthesis uh, with this this curly parenthesis, and you can give some values right name. A elixir, right? Maybe VM is a lang. Just putting something in here. Like, and this key and values can be anything. Okay, and uh, the thing with map is uh, the key value pairs that we add in a map, right? They do not follow any order. Okay, and they, they could be um, in different order actually when it is printed. It depends. Okay, and uh, this map do not impose any restrictions on the keys. It can be any type. It can be string, it can be atom, it can be number. Okay, for example, you can create a map, the key itself here being a number like three. Right? But you'll observe the order is changed here because, yeah, it doesn't keep the order. And that's not very important in a map. OK, now this is a shortcut to create the map. This is a long cut, actually, right? Uh, percentage, key, then equal to greater than elixir. This is a long cut, right? But when the key is an atom, we can use a shorthand notation to create map. Okay, and this is the shorthand notation. If the key is an atom, we can simply say whatever key we have, like this. Okay, and this is a map. Okay, unless I type in that correctly, I haven't given a space here, right? Yeah, this there should be a. Keyword argument must be followed by space after C. I am not giving a just C maybe. Okay. Okay. This is shortcut. So if that key itself is an atom, right? You can simply use this notation. Whichever uh, you use, there is no performance difference actually. So yeah, it's up to us. So typically, this is a good concise notation to use because ideally key should be atom. Okay, that's kind of good. Uh, it can do some performance optimization. Okay, and this this keys and values, right? They can be accessed using a built-in function. Okay, let me if I assign this to some uh, say map one, I'm binding it to map one, and then I can uh, use some methods from the match mo map module like fetch. Pass in the map and pass in the key. Okay, and you will get the result back if I'm using it correctly. It should be map one. Map one. You get this three, right? Okay, let me modify the map a bit and then try to fetch the value. You get, yeah, two and three. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, built in uh, methods that typically works with this. Syntax. OK, and uh, there are multiple other ways to do this also. For example, if you try to give a non-existent key, you get an error atom back. That's important to note, right? See, you get something called an error atom, right? So internally, it uses atom a lot. OK, and. Uh, 
if you do it uh, in certain other way for example i could also access the map using map of 1 and then if i try something like say c you get the value back if i try to do d you get nil back see there's a slight difference the difference is if you use the fetch method on a non existing key you get the error symbol back or atom back okay and if you use the normal uh, map and key access symbol here using an atom or something whatever key you are passing okay and if you get a nil back if that key is not there okay you have a dot notation also okay but uh, let's see how it kind of work if for example i could do map 1 dot c map 1 dot a okay but the thing is if you do map 1 dot e which is not existing you will not get a nil you will get an error back the error is key is not found in the map This is clear, everyone. So far, various ways in which you can access this. Okay, everything is available in the documentation. Huh? Okay, so I'll be sharing that link. Get yeah, the right link to practice it out. Okay, the the reason I showed you all this because you are aware. Okay, these are the things that is happening, and these are the return values. Okay, and these maps can be pattern matched as well. Okay, so we will come to that point. Okay, and then there are methods available, which you can use it to add, or maybe drop, or or maybe read data, right? Or maybe fetch, right? So those things are available on the map. Okay, is this clear, everyone, so far? For example, just to show you here, maybe I have map one, and I could uh, say map dot delete c. Okay. Okay, I am not passing a map, right? So map one. So now see the. Map one, that C key is deleted, right? But the original map will not change. The map one is still A, B, and C because there is no mutation, right? This is important to note. You'll always get a new copy back. So if you want to delete, you will store that in new map. Okay, and the new map will contain everything except the C, and the old map contains everything. Okay, so all these methods are already there. So if you are creating a CRUD op operations, right, and you are using a data structure map, you will have this drop method. You will have the fetch method. Okay, you will have a have a put or pop method. Okay, for example, on map one, if you would like to add, you could say map dot put new, okay, and the reference is map one. and we are adding a new key called d okay, with a value of say 4 okay now if you take a look at the result this should be stored in new map okay so a new map will have 4 added okay the key for it is d okay so similarly you have lot of things for replace another thing so whenever you see any method in uh, ruby with either a question mark or an excl exclamation okay, they are just an indicator that this question mark method is boolean method it will return true or false and this exclamation method may throw error this is an indication okay so whenever you see a method with a 
question mark or uh, exclamation post fix to that function name that indicate this question mark for boolean and this exclamation means may throw an error for example let me show you let's say we have this new map right a new map has a b c and d we don't have e so if i try to use map dot fetch okay and i'll pass in new map then i'm trying to fetch say c you get the value as okay and 3 but if i try to fetch say f f is not there right so fetch is returning a symbol of error but instead of fetch if i use fetch and exclamation there is exclamation yeah exclamation now it will give you an error that the key is not found you can see the difference right with exclamation and without exclamation right is this clear everyone so far what is the postfix uh, exclamation and question mark means boolean no? we'll see the ex example of boolean let me know in the chat window okay so let let me take one example of exclamation so let's say we have this new map correct maybe i would like to check whether this new map has some keys i could say map dot has key and i simply say d okay uh, and the map i will pass as new map okay so i get the output uh, map dot has kids undefined did you mean okay in fact uh, this method has this question mark at the end and this 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 is telling me it is true okay if i pass e this is giving me false question mark means you know this method will always return true or false okay and you can create your own functions with a question mark and exclamation na huh? it's just a implementation a convention that you have to use that if you are using question mark the result of that function will be a predicate means true or false and if you are using exclamation in your function declaration that will indicate to the use user of that function that you may get an error is that convention very very clear to everyone the same convention is available for ruby language as well take okay, a same convention because we know they are derived right they are inspired from ruby elixir is inspired from ruby take okay, a now you are aware of list tuple or a map and a map correct and you know these are the methods that you can use on them okay so let me know so far are we good okay now what i'll be doing is okay for uh, before the session uh, uh, the next part of the session okay sometime in evening after my calls probably okay i'll be sharing you two videos from youtube okay and they are very good so what you have to do is just follow that video okay and at the end of that video using whatever knowledge we have plus something new you will get in that video you will be getting a console based application that will allow you to manipulate maps in memory using a create read update and delete operation okay so so that once you do it you will be in a position to comfortably create some application using these concepts is that clear everyone okay and those videos may take about 2 or 3 hours to complete So let me know in the chat window. Is this clear to everyone? Okay, and then we will take that knowledge and we will see how we can add things like instead of storing that thing in memory, right? Maybe we can store it to a database like PostgreSQL. Okay, so that things will become very very easy to use uh, once you understand how to do those operations in memory. You will be able to do that in a database as well using certain libraries that is available as part of the Elixir framework, Phoenix framework. okay that's kind of the goal for the next part of the sessions okay and there will be lot of reading material remember i said on the first day itself right we have to read a lot okay so that's the only way we will be kind of able to go into the internals of certain uh, systems okay so reading will be there 
so those who are not familiar with reading or not uh, very comfortable please get into the habit of reading yeah, that will save the time as well okay so that's it for uh, this first session and i'll uh, uh, upload this recording as soon as it is done and processed okay it will be available in the same uh, same place let me check I'll, i'll i'll put i'll make i'll update if any changes are there because i'll i'll create a separate folder probably and put it there so that you can easily track those things okay so is this in a, uh, information good enough for the second part so that you can practice 2 3 hours let me know that's also very important uh, your practice is more more critical than my sessions okay great friends so thank you very much and uh, so uh, just watch out for the message i'll announce the session shortly for the next part it will be some some time around uh, say 4 4 around let me cross check my meeting time and accordingly i'll set it out okay so thank you everyone and any query you can drop me drop me a message as well or you can collect that query and we can uh, kind of take it in that subsequent session as well just note down your queries or if any unanswered qu queries are still there you can note it down and we'll discuss it also okay so thanks take care and we'll catch later thank you